Welcome to the Music for Mind documentary here at the University of Cambridge. I'm Eduardo Kidikimo and I'm a music fresher at Corpus Christi College. I'm also a music academic representative for the undergraduate course and the music library representative. Please join our fundraising efforts for the charity Mind as we speak to leading professors, professionals, staff and students about mental health and music here at Cambridge. Please enjoy the multitude of musical performances in this documentary and please don't forget to donate so we can help beat the stigma of mental health and give the people the support that they need. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades and this country is not alone. And so now is the time to take action because there is no alternative. And from Thursday until the start of December, you must stay at home protect our NHS, and save lives. Thank you. 2020 has already seen two national lockdowns in the UK due to a worldwide pandemic, which has undoubtedly affected everybody's mental health. Whether that's through the loss of a family member, a friend, lost jobs, uncertain futures, or even being confined to the same four walls weeks upon end with limited social contact. When it seems like we have nobody to turn to, or family relationships might be less than ideal, we turn to ourselves and our mind. Now, our mind can be a fantastic place, but it can also be an extremely scary place to reside. Our emotions flicker erratically, our self-criticisms are enhanced, and we're exposed to an immense amount of time to overthink. Now, in one interview with Dr. Sarah Foley, a developmental researcher at the Centre for Family Research, she discusses some implications of lockdown and government restrictions on mental health and families in particular. Uh, so I'm Sarah Foley. I'm a developmental psychologist at the Centre for Family Research and I'm a director of studies for psychology at Corpus Christi College as well. Um, and I am really interested in parents and children and family relationships um, across different family forms. And then with Claire Hughes and colleagues um, from six different countries, we've looked at the experiences families with children between ages four and seven and how they found lockdown in terms of um, you know their relationships as, as a family the parents well-being um, and how children have been found sort of learning at home as well so that study is ongoing and um, but really interesting looking at differences across the UK Italy Australia Sweden China and the US. So lots of very different experiences of lockdown. Um, and we'll be looking at that and publishing that soon, hopefully. I think for some families, it's been a chance to come together um, and you know spend more quality time together. But for others, you know, home and those extra pressures um, haven't been at that time. So if you know you combine in homeschooling with increases in job demands or just the trying to work from home and balance that as well, especially depending on the age of the child and um, the amount of attention and support that they're gonna need. Um, things like financial strain, you know, chaos. If you're living in a very restricted home environment, you know, that's gonna obviously contribute perhaps to conflict or tension or chaos within the home which we know um, is a problem for children's development and family relationships so I guess the extent to which COVID sort of disrupts your normal family equilibrium is going to be affecting um, the child and the relationship so you know as we've been talking about if the parents mental health experiences a dip because of COVID then it's likely that that might have an effect if they don't have an adequate sort of social support around them for example. Many are hopeful to return home after hours of working, whether at school, university or workplace, and we are able mentally to temporarily dissociate from our work. Working and studying at home removes this barrier, and a place of comfort and tranquillity suddenly becomes another set of rooms associated with labour. What are the consequences of this? Well, we miss out on the stimulating new environment that the workplace and the travels offer. The walk to the bus, the walk to the library, the break to grab a coffee 
and even the breath of fresh air are no longer times for our mind to mentally disengage. A moment to rid your mind of concerns and worries and be momentarily at peace. Due to the psychological association of working and high levels of mental engagement to a workplace, it meant we could walk away and dispose of those feelings to that place and return to our home with family and friends. Unfortunately, this wasn't a viable option anymore and we had to adapt to working from home and we still do now. And what would you say are the implications for students and workers who perhaps don't have this familial dynamic and are now alone? Um, it's really, It's been really challenging. Um, I think sometimes that you're, you're fine and you're okay doing it and then you realise um, you know, you've not been outside all day um, and that's not that's not good for anybody. Um, so the way I have coped personally, I really enjoy running. Um, so I, I did my first ever marathon this year <laughs> during lockdown, um, which was quite, which was really fun. Um, but yeah, so I think exercise has been really important for me and my personal well-being. One of the ways um, in which I've tried to support students is just checking in a lot with them and um, letting them know that it's fine that they're feeling crappy I think um, and that that's understandable. Um, I've been getting some of my students to let me know something new that they did for 15 minutes every day and um, whether that was you know telling me what they looked at on Instagram or what they what podcast they listened to or what book I guess at the start of term I was encouraging all of the students to all of my students to make sure that they looked after each other and just be kind to themselves and um, use kind voices when they talk to themselves and um, you know remember that they're all good enough and that they just need to sort of give themselves a break sometimes too. We spoke to one student about her experiences with lockdown and we will introduce our first musical performance of the documentary, which is not only very personal to her, but was written and inspired by the first lockdown this year. So I'm Temi, um, my full name is Temi Topedo and I study English at Corpus Christi College at Cambridge. Um, currently I'm writing an essay on race, gender and sexuality, so I'm very excited about that. Very interesting. And how have you personally found lockdown here at university? I think I've had a lot more time to think. Like, there haven't been as many distractions in that. There haven't been as many things to do. Um, in terms of coping with the situation that we're currently in, um, it's a thousand times more difficult than it would have been. Um, I've been told several times about the isolating effects of going to university in general. But then on top of that, we now have enforced confinement and there's a danger in that in terms of people are alone more so than they usually would have been. Um, and for some people that can be very scary. Some people are very scared of being by themselves. And in terms of university students, they don't have the support systems, if they did have support systems beforehand, that they would have had at home. One major thing for me is when I start to feel negative mindsets like, filter into my, my brain. Um, a coping mechanism that I find is amazing is just stepping out of my room because I don't want to associate those negative feelings with my desk and my bed and my wardrobe, like when I look at them, you know. So I have to get out of my room. I literally, I can't stay there. So I think that that's like a massive coping mechanism for me is just, whether it means going to someone else's like room in my household or going on a walk, like that's, for me, that's my sense of escape beyond those walls because I don't want to feel like trapped. Um, in terms of helping others, I think myself and the one other person in my household, we've kind of built a support system in the sense that when we feel like isolated and when we feel like we need to talk to someone, we just knock on each other's door and we go in and we talk to each other. And I think that that is so immensely like powerful, like the connection and relationship that comes from that and that comes from understanding each other in that respect. So tell me a bit about the piece you've composed. So I really wish that I could tell you exactly what was running through my brain when I wrote the song, but I really, I can't. Um, but what's really important for me is what it means to me now. And I've been like, like thinking about it over and over. There is no clear answer, to be honest. I think for me, the comfort comes with the fact that I've infused these lyrics with moments of pain, with moments of hope, um, and when I play the song, they kind of like come out again. If moments are what we live for, then how will I ever change? I'm standing in front of this door. Don't even know my name. Up 
and I'm going to be singing Schubert's Du bist die Rue. I first learnt this piece while studying for my A-levels, which was a very stressful time for me and for the people around me. This song tells of the feelings of peace that certain people can bring to us, and it reminds me of the support I received from family and friends. I hope you enjoy it. Sophie and I played Syrinx by Debussy for Music for Mind. I think listening to and playing classical music is a really powerful way of coping with challenging times because I think it gives us a really special perspective on the world and knowing that things can endure for hundreds and hundreds of years and still be appreciated and relevant. I'm Toby Mayhew and the piece I'm performing is Never Enough from The Greatest Showman. Many can relate to this worry about not being enough, and I find that this song not only encapsulates this, but calls us to admire our surroundings instead of comparing us to other people. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed singing it.
One of the ways we can cope and find support is to talk to a friend or a counsellor. We spoke to Terry Forbes Mitchell, the Corpus Christi College counsellor, and to various other students about mental health and the implications of lockdown. I'm Terry. Um, I am the college counsellor. I've been at Corpus, I think, for 13 or 14 years now, and I um, work with uh, both undergrads and more recently I've started working with postgrads who are struggling with anything to do with their mental health. That can range from struggling around academic issues to things about family to deeper issues so quite a whole range of things anything that's problematic for people I'm happy to deal with. So my name is Curtis I am a second year history and politics student at Corpus Christi. Yeah so I'm Eve and I'm studying medicine at Corpus Christi. So I'm Kit Edgar Johnson I'm one of the welfare officers here on the JCR at Corpus Christi and I've just been elected as the JCL Vice President for next year, which means that I'll be running the welfare team and helping college out with general welfare and mental health issues. Well, mental health is the generic term, really, for the health of the psyche rather than the, the body. Uh, I would say that good mental health means we're functioning psychologically and emotionally in a way that doesn't cause us distress. Probably the biggest impact on familial relationships, I would say that I've probably learned from talking to people, has been the lack of contact, like physical contact with mainly older relatives because people have obviously been understandably concerned about, you know, keeping other people safe. And I, but the other thing I think has been actually, you know, lack of physical contact, lack of hugs, lack of, which can, for some people, I think, I think for a lot of us, we probably hadn't realized just how important that was, but, you know, keeping your distance from people is cutting off some really important sensory information and some real safety for people and some security for people that maybe we didn't even realise we needed before. I feel that the current pandemic has negatively affected my studies in mental health, um, primarily in the sort of impact on my work, because of course, uh, when you can't go to a library where there's no structure a day, it does sort of add up a little bit. Um, but then I think beyond that, the sort of not being able to socialise has been made it very difficult. And then more than anything else, maybe the uncertainty has been the, the sort of main difficulty. I think other university students are struggling as well, but I think it's a spectrum. I think if there are underlying mental health conditions, they are simply exacerbated by this affair because there is simply, as I said, less contact with other people meaning that being able to take comfort in the company of others is reduced. You're left to your own thoughts, and when your internal dialogue can be more toxic, it means that the repercussions of COVID are even greater. But in terms of short-term effects of mental health, I think what's happened is, is it's, it's exacerbated anxiety. I think a lot of kind of either pre-existing anxieties have, have come to the surface or actually you know just being the, the anxiety about not being in control the impact might be that people seek control elsewhere in their life and there are you know traditionally ways that people do seek control which can actually have you know long-term negative effects and I'm thinking about things like trying to lock things down so you understand them if you've got a very strong perfectionist script or you are prone to disordered eating, things like that, potentially those sorts of things might be triggered by these feelings of lack of control. And I think mental health, at least in my case, strongly depends on to what extent I can interact with others and entertain myself with the comfort of other people. So I find that it's a bit harder to maintain your mental health and consequently harder to focus on your academics. You just don't feel that motivation to get things done because there's not so much of a thing to look forward to. Like, it's not like you have to get all your work done so you can go out and, like, go clubbing or something. Um, and also, I do just struggle to get out because there's less places to go and I've got a big workload. So I think that impacts your mental health. So many have criticised our generation as being weak or perhaps weaker due to the high statistics and figures publicised by the government around mental health issues. What do you think about this criticism? I think that they we obviously we have a higher, you know, higher statistics because people are talking about it more. 
Yeah, I actually think it's a good thing. I think the fact that we are talking about mental health issues and people are recognizing it, seeking help earlier is actually a positive thing. I don't think it's a negative thing at all. Yeah, I think we now have a language for mental health issues. We have proven ways of coping with things that are available to us, to your generation in particular, that previous generations simply didn't have. I would honestly say that as a result, I think that your generation will be stronger psychologically, not weaker. Um, I think definitely there's a lot more awareness and openness about it. There's, I think, a lot less of a stigma nowadays. I know, like, me and my friends will happily just talk about our counselling sessions. We share, like, a counsellor and we chat about it. Um, I think, yeah, it's just we're a lot more open about it. I know a lot of people don't really like the idea of labels, but I think the fact that people can just talk about mental health without actually needing a label or a diagnosis or anything, and they can just say, oh, I'm struggling, um, I think that's important. I have to say, I don't have um, much time for arguments that our generation is um, in some way um, more vulnerable or that we're, more, uh, we're less capable of dealing with the challenges that face the face world. I would say, you know, um, looking around me, I can see so many different stresses facing um, you know, people in our generation, whether they're teenagers, whether they're in their 20s, um, sort of housing insecurity, um, workplace pressure, um, this sort of obviously negative impacts of social media are very difficult to deal with. And I think it's no surprise, therefore, that we are seeing you know, these, these rising challenges in mental health, of um, related issues, anxiety, eating disorders, or whatever. Um, I think actually, um, when I look at a lot of my friends who have been through some really tough times, um, more than anything else, they seem incredibly strong people. Um, and I think you know, we're being challenged in new ways, but we're responding to them also in new ways. And I think we have a lot to be proud of. I think every single generation has criticised the following generation of being weak. But I think that's simply because of a gentle process of liberalisation, particularly in Western democracies, throughout the past few hundred years. As we've become more and more accepting of fragility, and moving away from the English stiff upper lip, each generation has been criticised for being weaker and weaker. We had the uh, sex riots of the 60s, we had punk, we, and now all those people are turning to us and calling us weak and unstable and fra fragile. I think it's all a similar sequence and I would simply ask people who say that to reflect on how their generation was treated by previous generations and reflect on how their experience is virtually identical to ours. I recognise that within particularly quite privileged middle class circles, people are becoming more and more open, more and more open to trans issues, LGBTQ plus issues, anxiety, eating disorders. But I think actually we need to really highlight that some communities aren't progressing as fast as others and that in many cases it's a kind of metropolitan phenomenon that we are progressing. I think we really need to highlight people who are in quite repressive traditional communities where this progress is far, far slower. So as much as I would like to say as a kind of privileged white man that things are getting better, I think the rate of improvement really, really differs depending on how traditional your community is. I also think, I know this is not necessarily about students, but I do think generally, I think there's been a feeling amongst some young people that they are somehow being targeted as somehow being blamed or being irresponsible um, by older people. I've certainly heard a lot of things like interviews on the radio and things where our students will very often, the finger will be pointed at students saying, well, they're not taking everything seriously. If they took it seriously, this would all come to an end. And I think that's really unfair. Hi, I'm Ewan Woods and I'm going to be singing Yesterday by Paul McCartney. This song uh, has a lot of deep mental health links. For me, it's always been a song that I've found very useful for calming myself down. And Paul McCartney himself has talked about how the lyrics have uh, been inspired by the loss of his mother. So I hope you enjoy it.
is William and I'll be playing Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words, Opus 38, Number 6, Duetto. This is one of very few of Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words to be given a title and stems from the fact that there are two melodic lines in the tenor and the treble which weave in and out of each other. My name's Hannah Dinesh Williams and I sang Rickard Strauss's Hat Gizakt Bleibs Nicht dabei, which Maddie Brown and I performed for the Pembroke Leader Scheme. Music. What is music? Why do we listen to it? Why do we turn to our music when we feel certain emotions? Why do we have many playlists of different feelings or for different occasions? A running playlist, meditation, sad, happy, relaxed? Its ability to recall memories, its ability to surface emotions and motions, motions of dance, motions of singing, crying, its ability to engage the senses and create empathy between artist and listener, and its ability to speak to us both personally and collectively, this reassures us we are never alone in whatever we are feeling. There's this sense of safety and connectedness with music, which sometimes can't be expressed through words, but just listening. Hi there, my name is Lola Flaxon and I'm going to be playing Rachmaninoff's Etude to Blow in G minor, Opus 33, number 8. I chose this piece because, after playing his music for years, Rachmaninoff's music is comforting and familiar to me.
I'm Olivia Bloor and this is my song I wrote called I Was Whole Before I Met You. This is about realising that we're complete in ourselves without having to find someone or something to make us whole. Hi, I'm Emily. Bark St Matthew Passion is one of my favourite works to sing. So here is Ich will dir mein Herz schenken. I will give my heart to you from the Matthew Passion. psychologically music like any other art form um, it can be appreciated at a sensory level right? and by that I mean it can kind of it bypasses the meaning making process that we often use and I think as I was talking about before um, it's often the meaning we make of our emotional responses that causes the problem okay because if we appreciate something at a much more sensory, bodily level, I think it can evoke some powerful feelings that we often don't even need to understand. We can just be with those feelings, appreciate those feelings, and understand that those feelings are part of the human condition. So I think for me, music is a way of almost bypassing some of the cognitive processes that we, and you know, particularly people in an academic institution, have been schooled and trained to do is to make meaning, to think about things all the time, which can often disconnect you from your feelings, okay? For me, music can be a way of connecting you back with your feelings. I think that music gives you a unique kind of soft, transferable skills of being able to translate a piece of writing into physical activity and being able to assess that based on your senses of your ears and so forth. Music has added a great deal of joy to my life, I think, as all form of art goes. It's just a pure injection of joy or emotion through my ears and into my head. And I particularly reflect on how a same piece of music sounds different to lots and lots of people because the way that we perceive music differs based on our own internalities and experience. I listen to a lot of the same music as my dad, so it makes me feel quite close to him if I miss him or feel homesick, because we have the same music tastes. Um, it also just helps me get motivated. I think putting on a certain playlist will help motivate me and it sort of like sets a start point for like the work I'm gonna do. A lot of people talking about certain bands or artists that they relate to in their music. Um, I hear a lot of people at the moment sort of in the eating disorder community that sounds 
that's a weird way to put it, but they talk about a band called Mother Mother and they relate to it and they find that that can help them. So I think it's kind of a nice way for people to relate to each other without having to explicitly state their issues. They can find a way to relate. I'm Julian. The size chosen is Romance by Sibelius. I describe it as a real hidden gem showing what the piano can do and consequently the emotions it can take you on. Hello, my name is Valentina Elnacupcha and I'm a first year studying classics. This is a piece called The Death of Julius Caesar, which I composed during lockdown. And I hope to reflect the political and social turmoil of that time. And funnily enough, it started off as some bars from a Russian Soviet pop song, but then developed into a dramatic tango with an anthemic lyrical section in the middle. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. similar vein, we can attach the exact same piece of music to memory. And I think music can be really, really helpful in being able to access really, really joyful memories with great ease. In many cases, bad mental health is a problem of being unable to grasp onto the positive aspects of your life, those you owe good things to, things you're lucky to have, things that in your past have been just pure joy. If you can attach those to pieces of music, you can form a helpful, positive defence mechanism against negative thoughts. And moving away from just young people, with dementia, another kind of horrible mental illness, music is invaluable. From not necessarily just classical music, but being able to play the music of advertisements that were performed in the 70s, 80s, when these people were growing up, it's of immense help. Because, as I said, you, the way that our brain works is greatly aided through being able to listen to music and being able to attach memory to music. This morning I was talking to them now, what they were saying to me was that for them, playing music really loud gives them an opportunity to just be completely in, absorbed 
in that experience, right? And it doesn't allow all the other things that are going in on, in their life to intrude. I think, you know, playing feel-good music, music that's familiar to you, that can make you happy, it can trigger happy memories. But also, some music can also trigger difficult memories, okay? But can give space to actually have emotions associated with them. I mean, I think who who hasn't played a sad song when they want to cry? There's a kind of permission giving that music can bring us that might be difficult without some form of art. And, you know, I think, you know, obviously there's forms of art that can do the same. But if music is your thing, I think actually it's a very good way of really, you know, connecting with it. Hi, my name is Esther and I'm going to be singing Franz Schubert's Andy Music. I hope that you'll be able to find solace through this heartwarming piece that Schubert wrote to praise the good things that music has brought to him. Enjoy! My name is James Edmiston and I'm going to be playing one of my favourite pieces, Ratmaninoff's Prelude in D Major. I find it a very calming piece and a great way to escape whatever else is going on around me. As a society that is now socially distanced and distancing socially, that feeling of being connected is lost. But music can bridge this distance. One student, Felix Elliott, started his own fundraiser project called Quarantunes, bringing people together through their favourite music online. So I'm Felix, um, I go to Girton College, I'm a first year um, music student. I play piano and a bit of organ. It was definitely, I think it was definitely a lot worse in the first lockdown. Um, I think that hit me quite hard, especially in the beginning. Just kind of everything at once, like not being able to see friends, like at the start not even really being able to exercise very much, like all the sort of things that kind of keep you ticking, you're not really allowed to do them anymore. Um, so that was definitely very difficult, but I kind of got into a rhythm, um, obviously music really helped. My project is called Quarantunes. Tunes. If people wanted to request a song for me to cover um, on piano, they would send me the request and then make a little donation to a GoFundMe that I set up for Mind. I sort of try to keep doing like keep like setting myself little musical projects um that's actually when i really started getting into youtube and 
making little piano covers and stuff. Um, sort of setting myself goals and challenges to work towards because um, before the pandemic, like, I had things to, like, I had duties, like, I was an organ scholar, so I had that to work towards every week, but then suddenly I had no responsibilities, nothing to work towards. So I sort of set myself um, my own little goals. During lockdown, like, music was one of the things that sort of helped me the most mentally. Um, and yeah, it was, it was one of the things that kind of helped me get up in the morning, like, gave me something to, to look forward to. Hi, my name is Gosha, and I would like to first of all congratulate my friend Eduardo on this amazing initiative. I was inspired to sing Hallelujah after listening to a cover by one of my favourite artists, Jeff Buckley, whose music helped to uplift and bring comfort to me many a time. I hope that you enjoy, and that you too find music that brings you comfort. I'm Madeline Brown and I will be playing Ravel's Shadow. This is an extremely colourful piece and I think it has this great potential to transport the listener to some other world. And to me, this is one of the most beautiful things about performance and why I love doing it. Hi, I'm Ben Mully and this is Bad Habit by Ben Platt. The song is about anxiety and emotional dependence, but whilst I'm singing it, whilst I'm playing it, those are feelings that I don't really have because it takes me to a different place. In an interview with leading musicologist in music and science, Professor Ian Cross discusses its relation not only to mental health and well-being, but also how music and science can be used in other prominent fields. So there's a, a wide variability, in other words, in terms of what one might mean by mental health from culture to culture. It probably does mean something like connectedness to other people, a sense of being able to function. And at the present, that's really foregrounded because we are all socially distanced, actually physically distanced, 
Um, but that also leads to a social distancing. And it's that social distancing that probably has the deleterious effects. People feel that they're on their own. It turns out music is quite a good way to connect people. So, so why do we listen to various types of music when we want to become more in touch with different emotions? Well, if, th- if we think of it in emotion as social, at least in part, if we think of music, even recorded music, as exhibiting traces of the social, even, frankly, when there's no human beings involved in its construction, it's done entirely by computer or on a computer, which these days would be quite common for a lot of types of music. It has a social significance, very strong social significance. There's been quite a lot of work on music and social identity, particularly with adolescence. It's a particular time in life when you're forming your identity. Music is an extremely good way of connecting, particularly in contemporary society, where, yes, in theory, you're connected to the whole world, but actually in, the, in real terms, you are living in a small group, with a small group of people, typically. You're not connected to the whole world, except vicariously through phenomena such as films and music, particularly. Music is something that you can use to enhance a sense of feeling attached, of feeling engaged with others. A lot of what, for instance, has been done on um, say background music, the effects of background music on um, executive skill and performance, you know, doing maths or doing puzzles. It really doesn't work unless you choose it yourself. But it's very likely to be the case that one's choice of music reflects socio-emotional needs and meets particular socio-emotional needs, in part because the court music, and it's, it's, you know, the, the, it's a trace of musical behaviours. That trace of musical behaviours is a way in to one's own extended sociality. And of course, one has to remember that this has been, the unless you were very, very, very rich, the only way of experiencing music 150 years ago was to do it yourself. So this is something that's actually quite a recent phenomenon. And how would you personally recommend to use music for somebody who's perhaps struggling with mental health? Well, for music students, do it. Play, perform. It's, it's what you do. You know, it's just a way of becoming more of you. If you think of the instrument, whatever instrument, can be voice, organ, whatever, as an extended you, which is completely free of COVID and problems, just, just do it, just do it. If you have the opportunity to do it with someone else, that's even better. Um, that's first and foremost what I'd, what I'd recommend to, to music students. To others who haven't been so obsessive, frankly, in in their earlier life as to spend four or five hours a day in the company of just a single instrument, talk to people. Okay, it's online, but talk to people. Exchange music, exchange ideas and music, make make up some playlists together. This year, one of my master's students did a rather interesting study on collaborative playlists. She was looking at the extent to which the act of making up a collaborative playlist was social, even when it was done entirely online. And in fact, the collaborator in making up the playlist was fictive, was virtual, didn't exist in fact. People just thought either they're making up a collaborative playlist with someone else or they're making up a collaborative playlist with a computer. And what we found was that for people over about 30, it wasn't really a difference. For people under 30, it was a huge difference. People who, who thought they were making up a collaborative playlist with someone else remembered more about the music that they'd added, the, the court collaborator had added, etc., and felt more connected through the music to the other person who didn't exist. Um, whereas when they knew it was a computer, no, it was not, not nearly so much. So that was quite interesting, but it did, it did suggest that even 
virtual or remote interaction can induce a sense of sociality, a sense of connectedness. So yeah, interact with, interact with other people. It's what we do to be human. It's, how, it's what makes us human. My name is Angel Wong, and this is a song I wrote called If. I wrote this several years ago during a time when songwriting became a particularly helpful means of self-expression and emotional release. To this day, it is still one of my favorite songs to play through. I'm Gemma Jeffrey, and this is my composition, Pictures in Green. In this piece, I aim to simultaneously celebrate the beauty of the natural world, but also to lament the catastrophic impact caused by humans on the planet. I hope you enjoy. Our final performer will be Phoebe Harvey, who will sing She Used To Be Mine by Sarah Barre. To watch more of the interview with Professor Ian Cross, with talks about his research and studies in the Gambia, the music therapy charity, more on cognitive science, and the socio-emotional benefits of music with children, please click the link at the end of the documentary. And finally, before we move on to our musicians performing pieces special to them, here are some final words from everyone we've interviewed, and we hope that anyone who's watching who needs help is confident enough to seek it, because help will always be available. Talk, talk, talk and more talk. Definitely talk to someone about it. 
don't sit with those feelings. There is no shame in having a perfectly understandable emotional response to a difficult situation. Traditionally, society has said, you know, we must be strong, we must cope with things. Yes. Your generation are definitely getting this right. But there is still that feeling that we must be able to cope with them. I don't think the problem is the feeling, but it's how we feel or are made to feel about the response we have to the feeling. Engage with the feeling, talk about the feeling. What you probably find is that so many people you know feel the same. For one, just sort of keeping in contact with people is the most important thing. So obviously when you come physically see your friend, but if you drop them a message, if you play some video games online, if you uh, do a quiz, that really helps. Um, I think for me, it's been just keeping that sort of community spirit going. Even if I can't see my friends who maybe live in another accommodation block at Corpus, um, just calling them, keeping in touch has been really good. I think more than anything else, everyone has learned um, the interesting walks of Cambridge and sort of getting out to the fence a little bit, walking on the backs, that's been great. There's nothing wrong with you. That's the main thing I would say. It's okay to be not okay. Um, it's fine to find your mind a scary place to remain by yourself because a lot of the time that is the case for a lot of people, if not all people. Um, so don't feel any ounce of shame and don't let anyone make you feel any ounce of shame because you're not okay. Look at bad mental health that you had 10 years ago and imagine your younger self and imagine if you could go up to them now and talk to them about their mental health. You would tell them how what they're going through now will be fixed, will be okay. It's not going to be the dominant aspect of your life. Then I want you to realise that that exact same process can be applied to you now. What would you, 10 years from now, say to you about your mental health problem? I think the most important thing to remember is that pain is temporary. And it might seem like it's going on for a long time, but in getting better, it, there are just ups and downs. So it's not like you're necessarily going backwards. It might just be upwards, just not linearly. Talk to someone. It's the first thing to do. Make contact, be social, reinvent your sociality. Keep doing like any sort of little things which bring you happiness. Um, obviously for me it was music, um, for other people it might be like art, like reading, Netflix, whatever, whatever it is, like um, don't feel guilty about taking time to do stuff which, which brings you happiness. Um, reach out. Um... I think if you're struggling, um, if you're feeling low, if you think that um, oh, I mean, it's not too bad, there are other people that have got it worse, then I would try and shush that that voice um, and you know text a friend, knock on somebody's door, ring somebody, um, you know ring people like the Samaritans or local helplines who, if you prefer to talk anonymously, um, and there's no shame in feeling the way that you feel, um, all feelings are valid um, and you know people are there and want to support you. Lean into it, accept it, you know, don't judge it, be curious about it and talk about it.